Hi, everyone. My name is Suken. I'm a managing partner at Iterative as a YC style accelerator focused exclusively on Southeast Asia. Today, we have Vibes from Outside Voice. Thanks for being here. Do you want to introduce yourself and Outside Voice? Hey, Suken. I'm the boss from Outside Voice. Outside Voice is a Singaporean startup, and we're building a no code app builder for WhatsApp. Cool. Before we talk about Outside Voice, I want to talk a little bit about your life leading up to be a founder. I think one of the themes we talk a lot about on this podcast is just how people get into entrepreneurship. The idea being, I think there isn't one path to get into entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs and founders come from a bunch of different backgrounds. And I thought yours was uh, pretty interesting. Maybe we can start with just like where you grew up. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in New Delhi, India, and I went to study product design in San Francisco right after high school. But yeah, I grew up in India, New Delhi. Uh, maybe, what do you, like, what was it, like, what did your parents do? Was it, like, you grew up like a pretty typical, like, Indian kind of teenager in New Delhi? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. In India, it's all about education, and my parents were very education-focused, right? So I was always meant to be like an engineer at an Indian engineering school and quickly realized that was not for me. I was always really attracted to product design and elegant solutions to problems. And when I saw that there was a big design movement centered around California, I really wanted to go there. I was lucky enough that my parents had the resources to send me to college in the States, which a lot of families in India don't, right? But yeah, so my interest in software came from it was a segue from product design and specifically industrial design. I actually went to school to study designing physical products like hardware. How did you know about product design? So I feel like when I was going to school, design wasn't a, it wasn't a designer, wasn't a job that I knew anything about. Yeah. And probably you and I have Asian parents and it was like engineer, lawyer, doctor. Designer was not in that. How did you know? It sounds like you wanted to be a designer from like a young age. How did you know about it? Yeah, I think I discovered it in high school and it was IDEO. There's a firm called IDEO out in the valley yeah. and they do a lot of great work. And just browsing the internet, I found their website and I just, it wasn't even about making things look good. They had all these solutions that they came up with. For example, Bank of America had this round off the change program. So every transaction on your card, they would round off the change and deposit it into your savings. And IDEO went through their process and came up with that. And that resulted in like a huge, um, many sales for Bank of America. And that was really exciting to me. Stuff like that. So it was just following IDEO and, and David Kelly at the Stanford School of Design and all these people and what they were doing. That's what kind of sparked my interest. Yeah. Is that a fun trivia fact? I lived across the street from IDEO SF. So their office was along the Embarcadero and I lived along the Embarcadero. Nice. And so I was like across the street from them. Nice. And I think, and so obviously Stanford's design school, which is quite famous, Bay Area, IDEO famously worked with Apple in the early days, also Bay Area. Was that kind of where you were like, okay, I got to get to like SF? Totally. I tried to, I actually took a, year, two years off after high school. And I just bummed around there and tried to get an internship at IDEO. Didn't work. But I was just living on the Stanford campus, just crashing with students all over and just having fun. And, but yeah, that's, I just gravitated towards that area. Back then, I was super bullish on a few different companies, which I noticed that they had a very strong design sense in their products. And so it was like companies like Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and but yeah, my and you, I was just there for two. Well, I was there for a year back in India for a year, and then I started art school finally. When I was hanging around Stanford, I was actually doing exactly what I do now, which was I was trying to convince developers to build my app ideas. But back then, I couldn't design, couldn't code, and didn't have any money, so I had none of the elements. I needed to convince someone to, yeah, some of the people I was trying to convince back then, they run really successful companies now. And I guess that's a little bit, that's a, a, a different part now. So you were really interested in design and then it, you were trying to convince people 
basically bumming around Stanford and trying to convince CS students, I'm sure, to build products with you. Totally. How, how did you go? How did you go from? Okay, I'm really interested in design, which doesn't necessarily mean building products, but you were like, you went into this part where you wanted to actually have, you had ideas, you wanted to build products. With- yeah. Building an app seemed to be the quickest way to scale a design idea, which you mm-hmm. own. This was 2006 and Facebook was taking off and a lot of things. The new iPhone just launched. I was there on the day the iPhone launched and so it was just a really exciting time. And I knew that if I wanted to, either I could design ideas and give sell them to someone else, or I could actually build a product and scale it. A software seemed to be the quickest way to do that. So yeah, my first idea was a music co-listening app, music app, everyone wants to do a music app. And yeah, that's the one I was trying to build at that time. How did it work? It basically worked. It was basically a Zoom call where people would listen to music together. That's basically what it was. Was it like Turntable? Do you remember Turntable back in the day? Yeah, it was like Turntable, but it was mobile first. And uh, I think dozens of teams have attempted that idea since then. And uh, listening is a very personal experience. People might share it for a few minutes, but not more than that. (laughs) It just came from being really into music and just being really passionate about it, passionate about music and just being like, it would be great to listen to music with friends together. And that would be really engaging because you're constantly sharing music with your friends back and forth. A lot of people do that. There still isn't a good way to do that. There's still a big gap in the market. People do, which isn't sufficiently addressed. Yeah. Really recently released a feature around this, which is you can listen with one. Yeah, Um, totally. It's really poor. It's a really poor implementation of that. Is it we really? Have, okay. Yeah, we discussed. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. which it is right now. What? Build the app yourself. At that point, yeah. you were like, okay. I- yeah. I knew some kids at Stanford and I pitched the idea to them. Just got ghosted by most of them. It was just, it was just sketches on paper, literally like pen sketches on paper. But later when I went to design school and I actually started designing apps better, you have way more potential to excite someone with. So it's in my earlier days when we were starting the first company, I was the designer of the group. Yeah. And the, my, the, my design review meetings were the, were the meetings that everybody was the most excited about. Yeah. Cause it was like, we would talk about an idea and they're like, people just get really, they have visceral reactions to yeah seeing it totally they also it is right yeah you're like showing them the design yeah totally it's possible to motivate entire groups of people to do something just by helping them visualize it because they can see a goal and then they'll be motivated to work towards it yeah there's actually just like a slight detour into this sure there's an interesting i i feel like the the problem that you had is a problem that a lot of founders have right which is you yourself want to do a startup and you're like trying to convince people to work with on your things. And so you're trying to like motivate other people to do it. And yeah. so one way is you can design stuff to get people excited. I feel like another th- way that I've seen is uh, engineers can obviously build stuff, but I've also seen salespeople who can sell stuff before it's either designed or like, built. And then they can convince people what your skill set is. That's, I feel like there's always stuff you can do. There's to- always show people definitely definitely yeah totally if you can close a sale before building anything that from the story is that bill gates sold the software first before building it so yeah that's totally possible yeah totally so long story so right after high school i was admitted to Stanford, and i was supposed to yeah i was supposed to join the class of 2012 and then i I screwed up my final exam after you get in, they ask you to send your final high school transcripts. Okay. I didn't do so well on those. And then they were like, you know what? We'd like you to take a year off and take the AP exams. You guys know what yep. AP exams are. Yep. And yep. I was like, cool. Okay, fine. Whatever. And a year later saying, you know what? I don't want to go to Stanford. I'm going to go to art school. Yeah. I think I was pretty upset about them making me jump through those hoops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess I just had, so for the AP exams, they're, they're fairly easy. Like you could 
take those after studying for a few weeks and still get a really good score. And I had a whole year to take them. So in the meanwhile, like because I'd been led into orientation and all the forums and I had an email address, I had everything. So I'd met all these people. I just started doing stuff. Like we were shooting a documentary on campus with all these students. They would just let me stay with them, made all sorts of friends. I don't know. Just when you have so much time, I was just like, maybe I don't need this. Maybe I can just, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I feel like it's because you got all the good stuff about going to college, like hanging yeah. out with everybody and didn't have to go to class. So you're like, yeah. why would I want to go to class? Then <laughs> so, yeah. I'm sure your parents were like, how did you tell your parents? You're like, hey. Totally. Yeah. They're super upset. They were first super upset that I managed to get my admission deferred because going to Stanford is anyone's dream. It's the dream. And yeah, it's the dream. And then after that, a year later, when I was like, at the last minute, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go. I, That's... Yeah. yeah. I think I was also, with class. I would rather build stuff. Yeah. What? So you had never been to SF before basically before moving there. And I feel like a lot of times, especially people in Southeast Asia, I guess around the world um, who are into tech, you have this vision of what SF is like. Mm. So I had a friend, she's going to kill me for telling the story. I just won't say who it was. She was very into tech and she went to SF for the first time and she rented yeah. a hotel room and basically had no plans. And honestly, she just thought she was going to go to a coffee shop, meet a co-founder and then basically start <laughs> Facebook. Like she just, yeah. As long as you're here, things will happen to you. And ended up staying in the hotel room most of the time because it's like, that does, <laughs> that's not actually how it works. How did, just how did those kind of expectations match up to what you actually saw? And you saw Stanford kids, which is a different segment of SF too. Yeah, totally. I think I was just really young and just malleable. So just going in and you just, Stanford, like day one, you meet people from every country, like Ethiopia, like everywhere. And just had a ton of friends. So it was, it's really easy when you go to a place with a network. Like even when I moved to Singapore, there was a whole EF network. And that makes it really easy. If you go in without a network, it's way harder. The, yeah, there was a little bit of culture shock in the beginning, but it went away pretty quickly. I think when you're young, it's much easier. But what was it like? I, there was just so much like palpable excitement around tech. Like, I remember being at talks where Zuckerberg was speaking. I asked him questions. Like, he used to be at that pizza place where, Cosby, where I used to see him over there all the time. And then I remember when the first iPhone came out, I was camped out outside the Apple store in Palo Alto. And, like, Steve Jobs walked in that day. He, like, walked right by me. And there was just so much, like, palpable excitement around tech even back then. It just rubs off on you. And when you're, I, when I stayed on the campus, Stanford campus, more than SF, actually. So yeah. I think, I think that's a big part of the, I don't know what, I don't know what it is, but that is definitely one of the magical parts of just being around the Bay Area. It feels like all of the tech, the big tech things are happening like in your life, like in the middle of it, right? Like Steve walks by yeah. when the iPhone... Only in Silicon Valley, like literally, yeah. that changed how you thought about entrepreneurship and doing startups and building products. I guess it was very immersive. That's what you're thinking about all the time. And the more conversations you have with people, even with business, I feel like the your greatest currency is like how many people you know and how many conversations you have. So it, when you're just thinking about it all the time, you're reading about it. You're meeting people who are doing it. I guess it just amplifies everything. Yeah. I I never actually produced any software while I was there. So I don't know how far <laughs> that took me. <laughs> how long did you work on the music app? And we never worked on it. I just pitched it to a bunch of people oh. and it didn't go anywhere. I built that exact same music app a few years later. And it was in TechCrunch. It was in New York Times, Wired Magazine. And it was pretty great, yeah. It, it, when I finally got around to building it, it went well. I would say just, and this is just looking back in my thing, right? Yeah. When I actually empowered myself to do some part of the process, and for me, that was design. You got to bring something to the table. And that's when I had skin in the game. That's when a developer would look at this and be like, okay, this is why I should build 
with this person because it's not just an idea. They're actually bringing something to the table. So for me, that's what it was. Years later, when we started building that app, it actually happened because I happened to be at a hackathon and I had a fully designed prototype of this app, which was like an interactive prototype. It played music. I, so yeah, I think it was just bringing some something finite to the table. That's what, at least for a music app idea, that's what helped me convince people to build it. Did you yeah. know that it sounds like you were trying to convince people to do it? Were people not willing to work with you on it? No, because if, you, if I look back at my emails and my sketches, it you sound like an insane person. <laughs> it's, it's literally, like, oh, people are going to listen to music together and they're going to, and it's a rough sketch with two circles in it. Have you ever seen the movie, The Hudsucker Proxy? Story about the guy okay. who invented the whole hula hoop. It turns out to be a genius idea, which just blows up. So it was like that. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, Were you Stanford? You could, or you could have done many other things where you're like yeah. art school, SF. Like why that? Yeah. By the time I decided, okay, maybe I should go to college, my doors at Stanford were closed because I told them at the last minute, I'm not going to Stanford. And yeah. Just like this idea for a drink or something that I was working on. So it's, it, yeah, more ridiculous stuff. I feel like that, that's <laughs> interesting. So it's, there is this like common thread, which is you didn't, you definitely didn't have the common path and it sounds actually like, you know, yeah. make this music act. Yeah. What, what yeah. like what made you want to do that? Sure. Yeah. It was just, it was just looking at the Indian culture in which kind of soda is consumed. That setting is very different from the States and where soda was invented and all this stuff was invented. So in India, people like you serve it to guests in a more formal setting. Sometimes when people come over, it's almost like a celebratory drink, marketing or even the product itself. So my pitch was just, yeah, this celebratory version of Coca-Cola, almost like a champagne, Coca-Cola champagne <laughs> meant for India. <laughs> I actually did. I, I think I pitched it to the vice president of marketing at Coca-Cola India. I didn't get explicitly laughed out of the room, but I'm pretty sure they were amused. Wait, vibes. I feel like I'm halfway to I'm halfway to talking myself into funding this right now. You, you still think this is a good idea or a bad idea? Well, to make it work, or okay. you spend a few million dollars, launch this as a separate company, and then get Coca Cola to acquire you. I think that's the okay. business path to making that happen. We're not going to do D to C champagne soda in <laughs> India right now. <laughs> Not me, but yeah, if someone wants to, I think there's room. Okay. Uh, how old were you at the time when you were pitching them at Coca-Cola? Uh, I was 19. And like party? Yeah. yeah. So I think just having the time to think about things. Mm. So I think the Stanford deferral was like a blessing in disguise. So it, when you have so much structure around your day and all this stuff, you're not going to have the... Sometimes you might struggle to find time to think of and execute ideas. Yeah, e even growing up, I, I lived in Algeria for two years because my dad was posted there and I was homeschooled for those two years. Wow. And I, yeah, and I remember, and that's when I realized it appeared for me. Like I would just do whatever I wanted, mostly just read a lot of books. And that's when I realized that having your time, being in control of your own time, that's really powerful and it can really stimulate creativity. Like a lot of people though, if they just have a bunch of free time, they end up playing like video games and hanging out with friends and stuff. But it sounds like you channeled it into like creative pursuits. Do you think that's like something in your upbringing? Is it kind of in your personality, your parents? Where do you think that comes from? That's a good question. I had no exposure to anything creative growing up. So they were not rebellious. Government employee is not known for rebellion. No, not at all. My parents worked the same job for 30 years each. Yeah, where does that come from? Yeah, I'm but, really not sure. <laughs> you worked for Intel from like yeah. 25 years. And so I'm also, I don't know where this comes from. But <laughs> it's interesting. I feel like there's sometimes you, I, although I guess we moved around a lot growing up. And it sounds like you've moved around a little bit too. So I wonder if that change in perspective sparked some of it. Yeah, I think that helps. And plus, like you and I have spoken before, 
for both our parents, there was uh, economic mobility, right? Like sharp. Yep. Sharp. I, yeah. yeah. It's just give people like us more freedom to like think about stuff, I think. Yeah. Privilege, I think, is the, the word okay. here. <laughs> I think privilege is called the word, is the word here. To- totally. Um, totally. Yeah. This Coca Cola thing is like fascinating. I always I'm, like listening to people's stories, like when they were young and they just do. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, I was basically like, I think I need to go back to school, whatever, whatever my entrepreneurial attempts are, I'm basically just getting laughed at, whether it is this or that. And so I was like, I, I don't think I know what I'm doing yet. The magical place. Yeah, I was, the, the art school I went to was basically almost like, it's called the Academy of Art University. It's almost like community college. It's like anyone can go there. Yeah. And you, but you were going to do industrial design. Were you thinking you were like, I want to work on physical products? Really excited about physical products. So uh, I was focusing on that. Yeah. Was it yeah. doing so much stuff? Yeah, I think that's totally what it was. Yeah. But uh, just picking up Photoshop in school led me into software design. Yeah. <laughs> into software design and building software products? No. So when I was after school, I went back to India and when I was in India, a friend was launching an e-commerce website selling peop- selling stuff for people who want to set up bars at home, to, like a really nice bar to, so that they can drink from. And he said, "Hey, I know you know you how to use, I know you know how to use Photoshop. Can you design my website for me?" And I never designed a website before, and I was like, "Okay, sure, I'll give it a shot." And that was my first like software design project. And then I went to work for. Paytm, which is like this Indian unicorn. While at Paytm, I still had the itch to build my own music app. I never really got to scratch that itch, right? I just worked at Paytm to work on that idea with me. And the first version of the music app that they built, actually, it didn't even make it to the app store because I think they just got frustrated and they left before we even finished. They were like, this is taking too long. And then they wouldn't even give the code over to me. And I was like, okay, anyway, it was a total disaster. Yeah. The second time I, then I attempted it again at my next job and that went much, much better. <laughs> so you're basically just like changing jobs so that you have access to new engineers that you can like convince to do this like music app. I actually paid oh. them out of my pocket too. And they didn't build. give you the code. They learned from that was you don't want some people can make it work, but you don't want these people working on contract. You really want a technical co-founder. Mm. So at my next place, I found a technical co-founder who was actually as into it as I was, who wasn't just doing it to make a quick buck. And that was the version that we launched and that, yeah, it got a lot of attention. So yeah. I feel like that, that you can find yeah. people like that. No, and that was total serendipity because our company organized these company-wide hackathons and it was like build anything and so six people at that hackathon worked on this app together we won the hackathon won a bunch of prizes and that was some validation for that developer that this thing could be well received this is worth something and then we all we just started working on it nights and weekends together and how did you i guess a couple of questions just like zooming in on meeting this engineer like how did you know that this person was going to be the type of person that wanted to take on this kind of risk that wasn't like the other engineers were you it sounds like you've been pitching this idea like throughout your life and you, many engineers yeah like each one you were like okay i need to find somebody who's more like this not like this yeah. like how did you figure out that this person was going to be the right person i guess, i think it's all in hindsight like i wasn't qualifying people based on when you have either one or zero people willing to work on your thing, it's not like I had a choice. Yeah, it's all in hindsight that it turned out to be the right person. Yeah. How would you, with the hindsight, how would you like? Totally. Let's see. Much better communication with this person. <laughs> and he had a lot more common interests and just felt like someone you could trust more. Risk hey. tolerance. Yeah. So this person, yeah. So this person definitely wanted to take risks because at some point they actually quit their job to work on this full time without me even asking them. 
companies and, you know, exited one of their companies only because you introduced them to it, then yeah. I think we so. just, I was talking to a friend of mine who was starting a company and is looking for a co-founder the right risk tolerance that to do a startup and they like, yeah. he was, and basically the way it ended up was this person said, I will join full, I will quit my job and join your startup full time. If we get into YC. Mm, I see. And basically he was like, what do you think about this? It rubs me the wrong way, whatever. Yeah. I was like, I don't think you should do it. I think that tells you everything you need to know. It's not a co-founder. Yeah, totally. So someone who's got to be in with you on it. You can tell by the conversations, right? Because the best thing I've heard about startups is that it's a shared delusion. It's a constructive yeah. delusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So are, when you talk to them, you look into their eyes. Are they as deluded as you are? Yeah. And they're just minimizing their own risk. On the other hand, you hear about people like... Uh, the, on the How I Built This podcast, there was the Calendly guy, and he built this. He built a startup by paying an agency in Ukraine, an outsourced dev shop. <laughs> and yeah, it's, I think they uh, Cal started with a dev shop. Yeah, I guess there is a lot of work. Yeah. Calendly is an amazing story. Like, they, they raise very little money. I mean, I pay for it. I don't know if you do, but yeah, I'm guessing totally. you probably do. A lot of us do. But yeah, there's lots of different ways that tackle it yeah i don't know if i would i i don't know if i would recommend their way the no, probably way not. of doing it but there's lots of different ways even if you can right yeah no of course Dude. like i know i know people who've sunk money into dev shops totally. money and time and nothing came out of it nothing came out of it <laughs> it was funny so the story i don't know if you've ever heard the story when brian and i first met so brian is yeah. one of, is the other managing partner at iterative he was we were basically we were having the conversation of should we all quit our jobs and Brian asked my brother, was like, are you quitting your job? And my brother was like, yeah, I think so, whatever. Mm. Brian didn't bother asking his brother because his brother was still in college. And so it was like, you have no job to quit. Yeah. And then he didn't, he skipped over me. He was like, yeah. okay, that's it then. And I was like, are you going to ask me? And he was like, I would have quit your job. Like <laughs> sometimes in those early days, I guess this is skipping ahead quite a lot, but like you went through uh, EF, uh, which kind of like famously puts people together and stuff. So I, I think this is something you've probably struggle maybe too strong, but like I've dealt with, right? Finding people to work with. Programs like EF, and I think like On Deck is another one, which is popular On in deck. the Valley. Yep, Handler is another one, yeah. And you will find a co-founder who you think you get along with or you get along with. But surviving the ups and downs of a startup without the presence of a deep relationship, that's hard. It takes a toll. But I guess what to look for in a co-founder, I guess if that's your question, I guess yeah. there's like what to look for, but then there's the other part too of like the idea of running into people who have that kind of risk tolerance. Uh -huh. So for you, you ran into this person who worked at the same company as you. Yeah. Was it a startup at that point or was it like a pretty big company? It was a pretty big company. Okay, yeah, it was a pretty huge. big company. Yeah, it was like, uh, it was already at a billion dollar valuation. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it was a huge yeah. company. Got it. Huge company, yeah. Which means that people were bored <laughs> without having much to do on the side. Collecting a little bit, like I, the people who really want to do hackathons are probably like yeah. somewhat motivated. Yeah, I think so. I found I found people at hackathons at EF, which is the accelerator, and yeah, it is self selection. It's people who are there because they feel the itch to build something or a business or a product or something like that. I guess let's jump ahead to the EF part. So you were in India, you worked for kind of these two unicorns, you had launched this music app, but it sounds like some other people like. Oh, I know we all worked on it for a year and a half. And then, yeah, it just didn't go anywhere. We shut it down amicably and we're all still really good friends and everyone has their own startup. All, all of the startups are doing well. <laughs> so that was your, do you count that as like your first startup? That sounds like a true startup kind of experience, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was the first one which actually built an audience and actually got international attention all that stuff, yeah. Uh, sorry, could you say that again? And wired and yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. It was, what did that it, feel like? It, that was crazy. It was just it was four kids from India just building this in their free time, and uh, next thing you know, we're on TechCrunch and all these places. We're getting calls from Silicon Valley VCs. We like didn't even know how to talk to them on the phone. It's, it's flew to meet Sequoia and all, all this stuff, and none of it That's really. The dream. Yeah. <laughs> 
none of it went anywhere, but yeah, that felt pretty great. It was honestly just great to see that you have an idea and that you build it and okay, maybe I'm not insane. Something yeah. that I was convinced was <laughs> worth something is worth something. Because even when people are spending a lot of time in that app, that's worth something. We had people sending us letters like, oh my God, this app saved my long distance relationship and all this stuff like that. It was very gratifying. So yeah. Yeah. We were kids. It sounds like you were at the age where yeah. you're like, I basically think of, I, we were, I think of ourselves as kids at that time. You were pretty yeah. young. You are building this stuff in anonymity and nobody cares and you build lots of stuff that nobody cares about and then your first taste of the tech crunch and all of that like i i like remember where i was and who told me and all that (laughs) stuff do you remember all of that oh totally i i was on vacation in thailand i think i was at uh yeah with a bunch of my friends and i had notifications on slack on yeah and it just started blowing up like hundreds and I'm like, what yeah. just happened? And that was our, everyone mentioning us on Twitter. And we were like, wait, what happened? And we just traced everything back. And yeah, it was a pretty surreal moment. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I feel like when the first time that happened, it was like, you couldn't tell us anything. Like you, yeah. you could, <laughs> I was convinced we were going to be like the next Facebook. Like right. you couldn't tell us anything. <laughs> Talk to me about your uh, first meeting with Sequoia. What was yeah. that kind of like? You flew. It's like the dream. It's like big Silicon yeah. Valley VC. You went to Sand Hill Road, I'm guessing. Oh no, this was Sequoia in Bangalore. Oh, but in Bangalore. We we get phone calls with a few people on Sand Hill, but uh, yeah, this was Sequoia in Bangalore. Yeah, all of us flew there. <laughs> we four of us flew there. Some people dressed up. Some people were <laughs> like more <laughs> more casual, nonchalant. Yeah. But yeah, it was just, it was a meeting with a principal, like the junior most person would probably just <laughs> call this in just to amuse himself. And we like, <laughs> Brian and I had this pitch off. So yeah. Brian would pitch and I had this whole thing and it was like. <laughs> no, we, no, we didn't okay, have a game, we, we were just going to talk about it. I don't think it lasted more than 45 minutes, that okay. meeting. Yeah. It was excited more than the investors. We were excited about like the people, the th- thousands of people pouring into the app. We had this manual thing where the founders would chat with the initial people and play a few songs for them initially. So there, yeah, I remember so many people that we spoke to. Did your servers fall over or anything like that? One point, okay. then got unblocked, and lots of other things happened. Yeah, I remember this one moment when the old developers when the first time I tried to build this app, the people who would charge yeah. me and then kept the code. I remember them walking into the app and I remember chatting with them and they're like, dude, great work. This is amazing. And I was just like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, so, I remember um, actually, sorry, so sorry. To I remember the first person at Stanford who had pitched this app to that person walking into the app and me onboarding them manually. Like, hey, listen to some songs. And that felt good too, because it was just like, I just want to let you know I wasn't insane. <laughs> I told you this was worth something. Yeah. So. The, yeah. You feel like it's insane, right? Because you're spending yeah. so much energy on something. And for you, you've been pitching this idea for like how long? Have you been pitching idea? I initially pitched it for when I was 18 and then resumed pitching it when I was like 24. <laughs> so it was a six-year hiatus. How did you guys decide to stop working on it? To post us on Instagram with customized video snippets and a lot of other stuff. And at one point we were just like, it's not growing. Users are not coming back often enough. The ones which do are not spending enough time in the app. Next feature fallacy that we were like, okay, if we build groups, maybe it'll take off. And we're like, we don't think this is working. Quick. Yeah. Next feature fallacy is when you're convinced that the reason your product isn't working is because you haven't built this one add-on piece. And as soon as you build it, it's going to take off. But more often than not, it's a mirage. So yeah, you don't want to fall for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally. <laughs> okay. So you stopped working on that. And then what happened after that? You were like, you had basically been pitching this idea for the six years you actually got people to do it you actually got some traction on it and then you were like okay we're shutting it down which 
It's got to be disappointing, right? Totally. But it wasn't a moment like we saw it coming over three, six months. Yeah. And there's a lot of tough conversations. We shut it down. It was disappointing. But typically what happens with these things is you think it was all wasted effort. And then a year later, it unlocks a new door for you. And you're like, oh, so that's what that was for. It wasn't wasted. So what happened was my co-founder from that music app, he joined the EF program in Singapore, and oh. started building this AI company. And he told them, look, you should really get this guy from India. He's, I built my, and so they, they bought me over here to EF and I built my first kind of funded startup. He did EF like a year before me. Oh. And I had a job in India at, at the startup and, and then, yeah, so I, only after he went through EF and he raised money himself, he was like, yo, you should try this. So yeah, that, that opportunity, that whatever I did over there led me to this. What, so it, what made you want to get back on the horse? Just at the end of the day. So I just wanted to take another crack at it, I guess. Um, also, it was just in my job, I was just like, I'm probably only using two to three hours of my time effectively. <laughs> Yeah, you have a hard, you have, I feel like you have a hard time with structure a little bit with the whole like Stanford asking you to jump through hoops and then yeah. your employers. I, you and I have talked about this a little bit. We're both very much like product people. Yeah. And a lot of product people that I talk to, there's this, I don't want to call it a drug, but when people really start using this thing that you made, you get this like satisfaction and, and this high that yeah. is like so fulfilling. And you, keep craving it you're yeah. like oh, like i want that some more and so i don't know i think for me that kind of keeps it going a lot and maybe for you yeah. that's like similar definitely all right yeah. oh, okay there we go yeah yeah it says please don't cancel downloads all right cool we're good i feel like their workflow is still kind of a little bit yeah it's so I there's like some rough edges here that like you know. yeah i wonder if someone else has built it better than them i don't know I, I mean, Squadcast does this, and then I don't know, there's like one or two other ones. Yeah. Um, this is the one we invested in, though. So oh, we gotta okay. Make, we got to make them better. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> all right, and we're back. So Vibes basically had to, uh, our interview went long because uh, we were just kind of like talking about stuff and riffing on stuff. And uh, as life of a founder goes, you had to run to a sales call. That's right. Um, so we're picking this back up maybe like, uh, maybe like a week later. Um, and maybe a good place to kind of like, this is a very natural place to start again, is actually talking about outside voice. Sure. Um, I think maybe just as a reminder, like you want to just tell the audience what outside voice does. Totally. So outside voice um, is a no code uh, app builder for WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is a dominant chat platform in like um, Middle East, Africa, Asia, South America, and a lot of non um, American places, geographies, basically. And uh, as businesses move on there, they need to build flows and automations for data collection. And we let businesses do that very easily without having to write much code. How many times do you say that a day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least once a day. At least, at least once a day, at right? At least once a day. Um, where did the idea uh, for Outside Voice come from? Totally. Uh, when my co-founder and I met at EF, they very much encouraged us to not work on ideas which the co-founders came up with while having a beer together and they encouraged us to work on ideas which actually came from industry research so the idea came from me going to a design meetup where the head of design at grab which is basically the uber of southeast asia and i literally just put my hands up in the after talk questions and i was like what are some of your biggest pain points right now with your team and uh, so just went riffing off of some of the things that i heard from him so it just came from having conversations with people we had access to and thinking about what B2B enterprise product could we build for those people. So did you, did you end up following up with whoever, uh, whoever that person was like, Hey, I actually started a company around this. Totally. Yeah. Uh, we followed, followed up with them, try to sell it back to them. We did, we did like land a contract with them. And then not only that, they, you know, uh, they were interested in investing both in personal capacity and then, uh, with like funds that they represent. So yeah, it, it's actually very gratifying for the person. You go back to the person who you got the idea from to show them that you built it. It's a great story for them. Did you, um, I think 
EF's advice is interesting um, yeah. around kind of like, hey, don't don't come up with the idea like around a beer because I feel like I've definitely seen a lot of ideas come out around beers too. Yeah. Um, what is there? Do you do you kind of agree with it? What's the rationale around it? I mean, there's no one way to do this, there's, right? There's there's no one way to do it. Well, one of the we did idea it around around a beer, and one of the ideas that we really came up with was, oh, what if podcasts had transcripts and then you could search them all and then. But as it turns out, there was other very smart people working on that, and Google built something like that. Other startups built something like that. We would, and whereas with the idea that we went with, we're still early to this, and it's been a couple of years, and we're still, you know, it's def, yeah. It, the research method led us to a more unique value proposition than what we just came up with between ourselves. That whatever we came up with between ourselves, there was probably dozens, if not hundreds of teams, which came up with the exact same thing. But what we're working on now, it's much, much fewer teams that have come up with this. Yeah. Um, the transcription idea is a good idea. I mean, the script, I think, is the big one, right? Like Andrew Mason from Groupon is like doing that now. Yeah. Is that basically what you guys were thinking? Like if you look at that product? We basically wanted to make podcasts searchable with text, all podcasts, right? And so Google's attempting that. There's a startup called Shuffle, which our friend built, which like- Oh, I know Ada. Oh, there you go. You know Ada? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Gilbert was an EF, her co-founder, in, in fact, in the same cohort as Cash and I. Um, yeah, so we, we just felt like we didn't have an edge there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess EF programmed us to think a certain way. Uh, yeah, no complaints. No complaints. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think you join programs like this because part of it is you learn how they think about stuff, right? I mean, that's part of the reason you join like iterative, right? Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, I mean, hopefully these guys seem like they're kind of smart. We want to see what, how they think about stuff. Totally. Um, totally. How did you, so I know you and Kosh met at EF. Um, I guess maybe not everyone is familiar with EF. Do you want to kind of explain just like very quickly how EF works? Sure, totally. EF is a founder dating program where a group of 100 people start a cohort and in the, over the next three months, they kind of speed date each other, work on ideas. Typically, each person goes through two or three co-founders before they finally land on something and someone wow. that they want to work with. Um, EF takes about half of these teams and funds them, um, gives them you know, some money, incorporates their company, and then you move on and you try to make your company survive and thrive. Yeah. And how, and what was it about Kosh that made you, were you, I mean, I guess when you first met him, were you like, okay, this is the guy or were you like, I, I don't really like this guy that much. And he kind of grew on you. Totally. Well, Kosh and I went, each went through two or three other people first before we finally uh, started working with each other. And for us, it started more as a friendship. We were just having lunch with each other and hanging out and just riffing on ideas. And then we were like, we kind of get along. Should we try and working on something together? It was definitely person first. And then, okay, let's work on something together. And then it was like, and then I had already been researching this idea. I was like, gosh, let's work on something that is based on research. Yeah. So it's kind I'm of kind of, I'm surprised that you guys didn't like get together in the me at the beginning of the program. Cause I feel like, I mean, I haven't hang, hung out with you guys. Like yeah. you guys are totally friends. So I'm yeah. surprised you didn't just like see each other from across the room and be like, <laughs> we should do something. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, both of us were initially gravitated towards super technical co-founders because that's the first instinct in an accelerator like EF. Can I find the most deep tech person? It's kind of like a fight. You get in there, it's a fight huh. for the AI people without even necessarily being clear on what do you want to build with AI. But it, that's seen, perceived as a scarce resource. So Kosh tried to build um, a Bitcoin exchange, a DeFi exchange with someone. I tried to build some AI thing with something else. And yeah, you slowly realize that, yeah. But that's, it's uh, it's surprising to hear because you guys are both technical. Like, it's not like you are non-technical founders, right? You're yeah. both technical. And even then you were like, okay, we want yeah. even more technical co-founders. Yeah, totally. EF kind of makes you think in these terms that hmm. the deeper, the more proprietary tech that you can build, that's where the best stuff comes out, right? Some of their flagship startups are building like, space stuff where like they've been at it for like five plus years with no product so uh yeah that's yeah we we really drank the kool-aid there um yeah. yeah and what what ultimately like what i mean you and kosh were having lunch you're hanging out what ultimately made you kind of come to a decision like hey we should 
we should do this together, right? Like, yeah. let's not talk to other people. Was there any kind of like moment that you kind of knew or was it just, I don't know, you guys have been working together for a while and it made sense? Uh, we just gone, each gone through a couple of breakups each and then we're still riffing off of ideas, really enjoying. Just do, you guys call, do you guys call it breakups? It, like internally at EFs, you call it breakups? It, it is called a breakup. There's a Slack oh, channel where a bot auto reports a breakup because it's a formal thing that you go on the dashboard and you mark yourself as single again. And the Slack channel reports it and everyone applauds. Everyone's like, hey, great job, guys. So there's emoji reactions and everything. It's a whole system. Yeah. Is there some drama there where somebody like breaks up with somebody but didn't tell the other person oh, yeah. and they find out through Slack? There was a guy who got on a flight and by the time he got off, he found out that he'd been dumped. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. That's kind of brutal. I feel like I feel like we could do a gossip podcast that is just like all gossip stuff that happens out of this. Oh, there's big time drama. There's there's yeah. cheating. There's people who like cheat oh, on damn. people while they're yeah, there's all sorts of stuff that happens. Okay, um, but what about the Kosh part? So um what what was your question about Kosh again? I guess if okay, if, if we just take this dating thing way too far because apparently they call it breakups too, there must be like a proposal, right? Yeah. Where you're like, okay, you are the, gonna be the person. Yeah. Is there a Slack notification for proposals? Uh, no. So the proposals happen offline and then the relationship okay. is formalized. But Kash and I were just hanging out and we just realized we really like talking to each other, right? Yeah. And we're just riffing off each other about new technologies, new products that we find interesting. At sitting down at one lunch, we came up with three or five ideas we were excited with. We weren't even trying to come up with ideas. It was more like, wouldn't it be cool if this exists? So it just came to a point when we were both single and we're just... I. I, I'm, I probably popped the question. I was like, hey, we, sh we should consider working together. Kash was like, yeah, totally. I'd be down. And then uh, later I was like, uh, just let's formalize it. Let's do it. So, But it, it was just the conversation was gravitating towards that. So it didn't really feel like it I knew he was going to say yes. Yeah. Oh, so like it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. It, it was like, it, of course, we should do this. Like, it, it, let's it, just go through the motion. Totally. It would be a waste of time not to do it, right? Because there's two people singing Single people sitting with each other with complementary skills who get along with each other, have ideas. Why would you not get together? Like there's no, that's, EF makes it so that there's no downside to it. It, yeah. it makes more sense to try it and get, get rid of the relationship in a week. If So they really remove the fear of trying. So that yeah. they definitely do a good job of that. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, when I first met the both of you, I thought you were old friends. Yeah. And, and especially since like you, like, Kosh actually went to Stanford, right? So I was yeah. like, oh, they must have met and he was in SF for a while. So you guys have like similar backgrounds in yeah. like you like overlapping paths. And I was like, oh, they must know each other for a long time. So I was surprised to hear that. Totally. Yeah, we both spent like many years in the Bay Area. That's probably yeah. why we vibed. Just like, yeah, also just like Indian bros. So we the first time we hung out was over Indian food, even Indian food at lunch. So yeah, totally. Yeah. This, is, this is a lot we have in common. So yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, just to kind of, you know, wrap things up a little bit, I have one serious question and then one fun question. Sure. Uh, the serious question is, um, you've worked on a couple projects before, um, and I think you've done EF more than once, right? And you guys were part of the Facebook Accelerator. You were part of Iterative. Yeah. Um, you know quite a bit about accelerators. Yeah. Um, do you have advice for people who are thinking about accelerators? Um, like, when is, the, when, when is the right time to join one um how do you how do you, how did you guys kind of think about it yeah how so both kash and i moved to singapore from other countries we land here with zero connections so when you think about joining accelerator i always ask you how rich is your network if you're in silicon valley with really deep connections which traverse in all directions you can get investments co-founders very easily maybe you don't need an accelerator if you're, if, if, you're, if you're sitting in another country, you don't have such a rich network, an accelerator can do wonders, right? Like even things like be on deck. I'm hearing so many good things about that. Yep. At the end of the day, when we are struggling with something, we have Slack channels available, like the iterative one, the EF one. It can be anything from like lawyers, taxes, yep. you know, logistical issues to broader issues. The speed with which you'll resolve those issues is gonna be much quicker if you have a solid network of people and an active engaged network where people actually feel obliged to help each other, right? Uh, there's a lot of networks and forums where you don't even know the people. And if no one really responds to it, so, so it's all about the speed with which you can resolve whatever issues which come up. And yeah, accelerators are, are pretty amazing for that. Yeah. 
So um, you think about it as like, I mean, definitely YC in the Valley is thought of as like a network, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, the batch itself is kind of helpful, but I think most people think about it as like, it's it's really the YC kind of community um, as anything else. And so I guess it's a, so you thought about it a similar way uh, for the accelerators here. Yeah, I would say so. The immediate benefits obviously are some, you know, some funding, yeah. And mentorship from the accelerator itself, which is sure, great, sure. which is great, but that lasts for a few months. the The lasting value that we really get is after the accelerator, right? Like probably every week, I speak to any fellow EF startup or someone, and same for iterative, right? Like we're in constant touch with them. Yeah. So that's what I would say the longer lasting value is going to come from. Yeah. Yeah, and we actually do that when we talk to. We actually try to suss this out when we are. Um, talking to people who are applying to the batch, like, are they just doing this for the money? Yeah. Because if it's honestly just the money, like, you know, I mean, you can get kind of like larger checks from other places, right? I mean, an accelerator is not going, to, no accelerator writes you, I guess Surge writes you like a million dollar check, but most sure. of it's like 100K, 150, I mean, us 150K yeah. USD, right? Yeah. So, um, and unless you're kind of interested in engaging with the program, yeah. it's, it's going to be kind of a waste of your time because we're, I mean, we're going to ask you to like do a bunch of stuff. I mean, not yeah. do a bunch of stuff, but I mean, during the batch, you and I talked quite a lot, yeah. right? I mean, we had to talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Um, totally. So, and even with iterative with us, right? Uh, so again, it just started with us, like almost just hanging out because you sat across the table from us. Totally, and, totally. And we were. <laughs> so I would say the way we, you and I started working together, very similar how Kash and I started working together, yeah. uh, just hanging out. More than, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, fun questions. I said that there was one, but now I actually want to ask sure. two. Um, the first question is, where is your favorite uh, place to get Indian food in Singapore? Because I love Indian food, yeah. and like, I'm like, I'm like, where do you go? Uh, and then the second question is like, I mean, when we when we first started talking, you did some DJing on the side, which I yeah. don't know if you kind of like still do. Um, but I was going to ask you about like, you know, what music you're listening sure, to. Sure, totally. Uh, for I'll answer the first one first. There's yeah. a restaurant called uh, Kansama, uh, okay. K H A N S A M A. Uh, so that that one's pretty bomb Indian food. Um, totally not healthy at all. I just feel like shit after I eat it. I'm just like, oh my god. But wait, 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 wait. wait. What's what's your order at that place? Because I feel sure. like I order like mm. kind of like a non-Indian person, right? Yeah. Like it's like if you get in there and you're going garlic naan, butter chicken. It's like okay, <laughs> you're totally not Indian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually like the vegetarian stuff. So you got to get the dal makhni, which is lentils. Okay. That stuff's really bomb. Um, then you got to get the aloo gobi, which is potatoes and cauliflower. Okay. And then you got to get the egg curry. That's really good. The egg curry? The egg curry. So the, those are three really good things there. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I never order any of those things. So yeah. clearly I'm doing it wrong. You try uh, those things, yeah. I've been getting a lot of palak paneer. Oh, yeah. Like, paneer oh, yeah. is awesome. Oh, paneer, paneer is like, great. Good. It's really high on protein, I uh, like, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Pretty good. So we should go there. Um, <laughs> sure. You don't do any more DJ. Uh, well, I haven't been able to simply because uh, it's on, you're not allowed to congregate here in Singapore. Oh, yeah, but, um, but yeah, I used to like um, basically listen to a lot of Afro pop, which is this popular music uh, from like Kenya, Congo, Nigeria, all these places. Favorite artists are like the trifecta of, there's basically the the Kanye Drake Kendrick of Africa, and I use Africa for the continent. But so it's they're called uh, Davido, Wizkid, and Burna Boy. Those are the big three. But yeah, yeah, they've got great, you know, just consistent hits. Like every song's which, a banger. Which of those three people is the Kanye? Oh man, which is the Kanye? Well, like, no, can you pick them out? <laughs> well, no one has the Kanye personality, but yeah, Davido is uh, he's he's the biggest personality out of those three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because who is the Kendrick? Because I feel like Kendrick is the critically acclaimed one. Ah, yeah. Like nobody can, nobody says they don't, they don't like yeah. Kendrick, right? Maybe, maybe Burna Boy is the Kendrick, uh, okay. and then Dr Wizkid is the more commercial one, like Drake, I guess. But yeah, the, the, yeah, that's the trifecta, the Trinity. <laughs> you should. Have, did you ever think about doing a live DJ live stream? <laughs> yeah, I guess I have thought about that. I mostly just DJ just to like see all my friends in one place and like get a lot of free mm. drinks. So I, I just <laughs> I just wonder what I would get out of that. Okay. But uh, but yeah, it, it was it was fine while it lasted. But funny story when I actually started DJing here in Singapore, I didn't know how to DJ. I just walked into a bar. I walked into a bar and I told the guy, 
yo, I'm a famous DJ in India. You should let me DJ. And once he said, okay, and I'll pay you. Then I went back home and I learned how to DJ. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? Yeah. You just rolled up and you're like, I'm really famous. Yeah. That's, that's what happened because the Afro DJ, the resident Afro DJ, who's actually from there, yeah. he was leaving. And I knew there was, there was going to be an opening. So he was leaving. And then um, I just went up to the bar owner and I was like, yo, you know, you should let me take a spot. I totally play Afro music back in India. But I, it, the only reason it worked was because I knew all the music, like every all yeah, the yeah. music, right? So basically what you need is extensive knowledge of a lot of different playlists. And then the actual mixing part is not hard at all. Yeah. Did anybody find out? Like, did you get up on stage and they were like, wait? No, it's, a, it's actually very easy. It's, you know, the, like the software is advanced enough that yeah. as long as the beats per minute is close enough, it'll blend it together. So it's, it's actually fine. It's just like a, okay. putting a playlist together for a party. But yeah. <laughs> I should get you to do a live stream DJ for, uh, for iterative. Sure. Like, I've seen, uh, I see the quest love from the roots. He yeah. does it on Facebook live yeah. and on like YouTube and stuff. Yeah. And I don't know. I just, I, he does it for like three hours and I, sometimes oh, awesome. hang out that'd be pretty stuff. cool. It'd be really interesting to find out how much audience overlap there is between like Afro pop listeners and iterative listeners. <laughs> might be a lot, might be some, might be none. I'm but, going to probably tell you that if we send out a survey, I think most people have never heard of Afro uh, <laughs> pop, but I feel like a lot of people will come check you out and hang out. Sure. That sounds fun. That sounds pretty fun. All right, cool. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, and um, yeah, what? I, your stories are like, I, I feel like your DJ story is something that like um, comes up a lot of like entrepreneurship. Um, so <laughs> I like stuff like that. Totally. Fake it till you make it big time. Thank you. Till you make it. That's what we should call it. That's what we should call this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Vibes. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> Kept faking it. Never made it. Never made it. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks, man. Well, thanks, Sukan.